I see the hospitality yeah. as such a wonderful way yeah. to preach the gospel, actually, to show love for others to reg- and not judge them, to uh, serve other people selflessly. And that's part of the reason I feel so passionate about what we even, the, the small amount of you know success and resonance that we found with Live Oak Lake. I just want to kind of jump right in. I know you grew up in a really large family. I kind of wanted to talk about what that was like. And like, I'm really interested in like financial blueprints and mental models, financial mental models that people inherit from their family. So I kind of wanted to go into that. Like, what was it like growing up in a huge family like that, that you did and uh, some of the financial mental models you inherited from them? Yeah. So I was born and raised here in just outside of Waco, Texas. Um, my dad and mom were from Colorado and, uh, actually had joined this intentional agrarian Christian community, uh, in their early twenties met and were married. And then the community eventually moved to Texas. I still live here, was, I've been here all my life. Um, I did spend 10 years in, in, uh, North central Idaho when my family moved up there to start a, a sister community. Uh, between 2009 and 2019, uh, but then moved back to Texas. And my grandparents were here as well. So they were also part of the community, very close knit relationships, uh, was homeschooled, uh, interacted a ton. You know, there's 12, 1500 people in this, um, this, this community. So uh, a lot of like the high schooling was classes were shared on different topics, but this, the main education was centered around the home and both my dad and mom played v- equally vital roles in, in teaching us. And they took a very re- a relational approach. So we would have all kinds of, you know, we would have writing workshops um, in the living room as a whole family and everybody is writing on, you know, a different grade level and uh, doing similar exercises. And we'd have history lessons around the dinner table, depending on what we were eating, which we probably grew in our garden uh, we farm with horses here. We try to grow as much of our own food as possible. Handcrafts are another huge emphasis. So we have craftspeople that really specialize in every major craft you could think of from blacksmithing to woodworking to pottery to weaving, to knitting, um, painting. I'm an artist uh, and a whole a whole bunch more. We actually have a school embedded in the community as well. So we teach folks from all over that want to learn some of these hand skills. And, and basically the vision is we're trying to supply the necessities of life as much as possible. We're not perfect. And we, we certainly use modern technology. We just want to be super sensitive with how that impacts our lives. Yep. And we've made some really hard, uh, decision, hard line decisions like not having internet and not having television in our homes, um, to preserve the values that uh, mean a lot to us. So families are the are the emphasis. Relationships are the emphasis. And I've been very very lucky to grow up in that environment. I really couldn't have thought of a better environment as a kid to grow up in. My dad had a plumbing company. He was a a plumber here in Texas uh, for twenty some years, and so I grew up, you know, spending time when I wasn't doing other things. Uh, at his side and getting to go kind of the big treat was getting to go as as a little kid, getting to go to a job with him, Mm -hmm. um, which was really fun. My grandfather was a custom home builder here in Texas as well. Um, built a ton of really, really cool houses in, in the greater Texas area. And so also got to ride along with him. He was really a perfectionist and a master at his craft. And that was, it was hard to describe how impactful his that experience was on on my life and and my brothers as well. We got to work at his ranch, which was just down the road, a couple times a week. And in addition to our own farm, of course, where we had all these animals, and we were constantly clearing trees and building trails and building structures. And so I'm number five out of ten children, and my older brothers were really the pioneers when it came to all of the construction endeavors and learning all these other skills. So I actually didn't do any of that until I was (laughs) late, late as I was, I was what 14 or 15 when most of them started at like nine or 10, 14 or 15, I started working in the family construction business. At this point we had moved up to Idaho and my dad had transitioned more from plumbing to general contracting. And so I just started 
at the ground floor, literally, right. uh, as a general laborer, sweeping floors and um, worked my way up through that, learned pretty much every, every aspect of the trades, uh, did a little bit of everything, concrete, framing, you know, plumbing, electrical, all the different aspects, which was so valuable looking back. And then by the time I was 19, I became a project manager and uh, so was running multi-million dollar projects, um, which I've got lots of interesting stories there too. It's just a different dynamic when you're a little 19 year old pipsqueak. Right. And um, as much as you know, because I genuinely obviously knew something, I'd been working in it for for years. There was a ton I didn't know, mm -hmm. but I was I've always been very ambitious and you're interacting with all these people that are many, many decades older than you and kind of like looking down their nose at like, who's this, who's this little dweeb? Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, but, but anyway, having, going back to your, the one part of your question, as far as the frameworks, um, I think <laughs> this is maybe a funny rule. My dad did set a rule when we were really young that no financial, there could be no financial transactions in the family, uh, without his direct involvement and approval. So I was opening ba like banks from the time I was six years old and coming up with all kinds of schemes to make money off of my siblings. And some of them did the same. Right. Um, so we, we had a regulatory uh, body there That's to step hilarious. in and help. But I would actually say that that was a valuable lesson because it taught me the value of there's a there's a biblical proverb that says there's wisdom in a multitude of counsel and having his input still to this day is extremely valuable in every major decision that I make financial or otherwise. Uh, so I would say that was, th that was a little bit of a taste of what it was like growing up. That's awesome. So was money, it sounded like obviously you, your family was super entrepreneurial. Were your siblings also doing, I, I know you had a lot of entrepreneurial gigs, like starting at age five or something like that. Was everybody in the family like that? Almost everybody, one of a few of my siblings were less so, but they have all been uh, very successful and not in terms of, you know, money has definitely never been the main criteria of success for us. Like I said, it's just been embedded into who we are relationships. And I know this is, this can sound cliche, but it really is true. Like we, we really want to demonstrate this with our lifestyle. And so for me today and the businesses that I'm doing and even the ones that my family is still involved in. And they, like I said, they've been very successful with a lot of the things they've done, um, are really just a, a fraction of the overall lifestyle. When you consider all these other aspects of living in an agrarian life, living in community and, uh, but yeah, I, I was definitely on the cutting edge of <laughs> entrepreneurship, so to speak as, as a, as a young, um, adolescent and teenager. And had to learn a lot of painful lessons along the way too. I've I've always been a radical optimist, mm -hmm. and before I before the character was really built in me that my parents had the wisdom to really prioritize at certain stages of my life, uh, I would just go all in on something, and that was really good sometimes. But it led to actually some um, foolish mistakes that I probably could have avoided getting into uh, risky derivative stock trading and things like that. Um, but again, you, you learn from all of those things and really all the major mistakes were just a result of trying to outdo what I thought my dad could probably help, could, could, could see as far as what the, what these opportunities were. And, um, but I learned from all of those as well, but yeah, our whole family has been that way. My mom started a cheese making business with a friend of hers when she, when, when they were younger. And actually that was another business I grew up working in. I then started an, um, uh, a business with her when I was in high school, we made, we milked cow. We, we had this herd of milk cows and we made fresh artisan cheeses. Oh. So I actually like went all in on that for like three or four years. That's awesome. Um, learned all about these really, you know, specific techniques for, uh, cr creating these really, really cool cheeses. And then we actually, that, that business is still thriving, uh, sold at the farmer's market every single week. I had a business making craft sodas brewed with yeast. Um, this was more of, this was definitely on the experimental edge of my pursuits. Uh, that business was really interesting. I had a few built in liabilities like bottles exploding, mm -hmm. uh, randomly, but, um, yeah, also one of my first ideas, which I don't, don't ask me why I was passionate about this at the time, but I went on eBay and would find, and then would also go to old antique stores find these dilapidated hundred year old typewriters. I was really fascinated with typewriters for some reason. 
but would take those and bring them home and then just like not knowing anything about them would sort of take them apart. And to be honest, I'm actually not necessarily a mechanical kind of person, uh -huh. but I was passionate enough about it that I would take it apart and try to just fix it and make it better and then take better photos of them and re resell them on eBay. Um, that is awesome. So I yeah, you just see like wide, wide spectrum. My brother had a, um, this was actually a great idea. I just came across a bunch of these old editions recently and I want to do this for my own kids. But he started a newsletter when he was like eight years old. Wow. And we, we had this fictitious town actually in our backyard called Laketon uh -huh. and literally all created roads, streets, built little buildings for it. And then he would publish like in the old Microsoft Paint application, yeah. if you remember that, yeah, yeah. Would, would format and publish these little weekly newsletters. And then all of us became contributors. My mom was like the editor and uh, grew this to a network. It, it evolved over time. It's pretty cool to look back and see yeah. over like a five-year process, but grew it to a decent size circulation of friends, family, and then, you know, just circles out from there. Uh, which was a pretty cool model, the subscription model, and um, also helped incorporate some of those writing and English and all the other skills into the businesses that we were starting. That sounds like an idyllic way to grow up, quite frankly. Like, I, I'm kind of jealous. Like, I, I just think, like, making cheeses and working on typewriters and, you know, writing a newsletter. I mean, you guys were ahead of your time with the newsletter. We we talked about our <laughs> newsletter with we study markets, but it's just such a great way to grow up and to be experimental. And uh, I think it's just ideal. And is the community still going on? Like the the community you grew up in, is it still active and functioning and thriving? Oh yeah, so it's actually really entering into its uh, high growth phase. So my wife's, I, I got married two or three years ago. My wife's grandparents actually founded it 50 oh, years wow. ago okay. last year. So can I and ask, is it, it Mennonite? It, I'm in Ohio and there's like a lot of Mennonites. and it, uh, No, so it is it is similar to the Anabaptist tradition, which is what the Mennonites yep. and Amish came out of, yep. in that we are very, we, we prize simplicity in life. Yep. Um, like I said, we, we make conscious efforts as far as technology goes, but we don't have certain lines like we're not going to use modern technology. It's right. just we're very careful as far as how we incorporate that. Um, but yes, there's definitely similarities. It's called Homestead Heritage, if, it, if you want to look it up. I do. But okay. right now, we're at like 12 communities worldwide and expanding incredibly rapidly. So in the last 10 years, they're just popping up all over. There's such a hunger for people. Yep especially as just the entire culture begins to change. And I would say fray yep. in terms of society 100%. and relationships and everything. Enti incredible hunger for a genuine yep. shared life like this. Yeah. And there's been a lot of models that got this very wrong. And I feel incredibly privileged to be in a place that so far has borne pretty good, consistent fruit. So yeah, it's going strong. And that is certainly my truest passion as far as expanding this vision of uh, these communities, sustainable communities worldwide. I would love to learn more about it. We could do a whole episode on just this, I think, obviously. Um, but yeah, very fascinating to me. I, I just, uh, I, for one, like, I think you're a hundred percent right about like there, there is this deep hunger in society for that. We live these kind of crazy complex lives, um, fast technology. And, you know, there's always this hunger for returning to simplicity and, sane values i would say absolutely and it's just like where else do you find really the lifestyle that we're living today we would argue is not very different from what it would have what the normal american would have experienced say a hundred years ago yeah uh but then we've seen so many rapid changes and they're not all bad obviously in the name of progress a lot has been done that we would say is not progressed us necessarily right. in terms of where we're trying to go and yet obviously we appreciate a lot of different conveniences. And yet we also recognize that even in some of these modern conveniences, there is a very double-edged sword there. And, you know, social media take, for example, is a, is a great, is a great example to show how, yes, I believe it can be a very, very valuable tool, mm -hmm. but in the hands of, you know, adolescent kids, yeah. it can also be extremely destructive. And you, you're seeing all of these downstream effects of that, that are just really kicking in and it's very unfortunate to see how that has affected, among so many other things, just the family unit, the nuclear family, marriages, families, yep. um, you know, 
gener multi generational. Uh, uh, one of the things that I feel extremely privileged, and I think I already described this, is the opportunity to grow up with my grandparents on both sides, yeah. extremely involved in our lives, yep. very aligned in terms of the values that they were trying to cultivate as well. And there's just not very many places where you have the opportunity to grow up with such a robust, uh, multi dimensional ecosystem of relationships like that, that is so impactful to a young person in setting the trajectory of their life. Oh, it's huge. And, and like these skills that you develop at, at a really young age that most kids never get a chance to do. It's, um, yeah, it just speaks volumes to the benefits of it. I, I wanted to ask a little bit about in, in the Mennonite and Amish community, they have this thing called going Yankee. I think when you're around 16 years old, you're allowed to leave the community and go experience what life is like outside the Amish community. Was there anything like that? Or did you ever hunger for like, I can't stand living like this anymore. I want to go live like a normal life with, you know, or not normal, but like try what mainstream society or culture is doing. Yeah. So we don't have some kind of formal program, but I have to say like the older I get, and now that we, my wife and I just had our first child last year and contemplating being a dad and how I want to raise him and the things I want to instill in him in my son is it made me increasingly appreciate the discernment that my parents had in as I would say giving us enough rope to hang ourselves but not letting us do that yeah and as a community collectively I mean we host here at the the Waco campus we host two or three hundred thousand people a year come through here it's actually a huge touristic destination. There's a craft village, the, the working farm, there's a farm to table restaurant, all kinds of events that we have throughout the year. Music is a huge part of our, our culture. And so we, we're extremely open. Like we we're anything but living in a bubble in that sense. Like we have people come through all the time. Yep. And so there's an aspect where we are very familiar with the culture. It's just, again, I think there's an incredible level of wisdom and discernment and mm -hmm. I, I can only appreciate what my parents had and, and hope to be able to have the same for my children. I would say another emphasis in just our general approach to community is there's, there is not a top down, so to speak, um, authority structure. So it's there, decentralized in a way. Yes. There's very, very pluralistic, um, leadership mm -hmm. and family units again are extremely, uh, are emphasized like the responsibility that fathers have mm -hmm. is not trumped by anything else actually. Right. So obviously there are certain ideals and patterns that we all um, very voluntarily agree for identity's sake, for unity's sake to conform to, though there's always, that's a, that's an ongoing conversation mm -hmm. and, and questions and, you know, challenges that are constructive are very much encouraged because that's, that's what keeps us from becoming just traditions based. Mm -hmm we're very faith is at the center of right. everything that we do. So yep. I would say, and I'm obviously, this is my worldview, but if it, without the faith component, it's completely impossible to hold together yeah. a group of people like I'm describing. I mean, there's just any number of relational internal conflicts that will come up and threaten to divide everyone sure. um, on every level. If you don't have certain ideals that, and we believe it's it's a supernatural relationship with yeah. with the creator of the universe, with God. So I'm obviously a Christian, yep. and faith has been central personally in every decision I've made, even through my business, through um, this entire journey with Live Oak Lake and uh, sharing the story, and again with every other decision as well. And having having a lighthouse, so to speak, to look to and sort of determine every decision for me, which is my own relationship with, with God himself, but also through the network of relationships with my, with, you know, my fellow, uh, Christians and, um, community members. And, and as we all determine the direction of where we're going collectively and individually is, is just, you can't substitute anything for that. So that's kind of answering a question you didn't ask, but faith has been a central tenant to everything I've done. Well, it's fascinating to me. I did want to touch on that. Um, Chris Powers had an interview that he did where somebody asked him when he, you know, became deeper in his own faith and becoming more of a Christian and following Christ. And if he thought that the question was like, what, did he think that would uh, hinder his ability to be successful in the business world? So I kind of wanted to touch on that. Like, how has your faith 
affected your success in the business world? Do you think there's anything that like would hold you back? You know, business can be fairly, can be fairly cutthroat, competitive and um, challenging. Yeah. I don't know if anyone's asked me that question explicitly, so it's a good one. I, yes, absolutely, it can affect it. And let me try to give you an example. Um, even in this whole journey, which was totally unexpected, which I'm sure we'll talk about later on, but with Live Oak Lake and now growing a little bit of an audience on Twitter and sharing the story and having a bunch of people from all over reaching out and wanting to offer a lot of different opportunities, investors, venture capital, private equity. Um, by nature, I'm a very driven and <laughs> ambitious person. I think my childhood is, yep. is a testimony to that as I described, but, uh, I know that I have all kinds of, so I have this built in entrepreneurial drive mm -hmm. and I believe that God gives every human being talents and yep. drives and ambitions, mm -hmm. um, that they can either choose to hijack for themselves right. to build their own empire, their own kingdom to ultimately just replace the need for a God, mm -hmm. or they can use those and find their higher purpose and their calling and the pathway that God would have laid out for them that connects them to other believers that is ultimately, hopefully going to give a testimony collectively of an alternative kingdom. So our view of my view of, of Christianity is that we are truly supposed to be a called out people, an alternative kingdom that is supposed to en encompass every aspect of business, family, life, every aspect of society and economy. So um, our vision as a church has very much been focused on that. Hence the crafts, the, the agriculture, any of one of these things could become the center. And yet collectively, if they're ordered appropriately, they can be this beautiful mosaic that, I believe can testify to, to, you know, the lifestyle we're trying to live, the person we're trying to emulate in Jesus mm -hmm. and the lifestyle we're living more than even just straight up preaching and teaching and traditional evangelism, though we certainly, uh, want to do that as well as, as God leads us to. So there's a great quote by, uh, St. Francis of Assisi. He said, preach the gospel and if necessary, use words. And yeah. that's kind of an unspoken mantra for us, for me. And so yeah, I think that there's all kinds of areas where I have to be very careful that the business drives inside of me and just, I would say ultimately this more selfish nature that yeah, we all have, we all that have I it. certainly right. have, doesn't e eclipse the greater purpose I was talking about. And so how do I harness all of those gifts and talents, again, to contribute to a greater cause that is so much bigger than me that it's going to, that started long before me and that'll hopefully go on long after me. And, um, I don't believe that that means we're supposed to be living in some sort of asceticism, yeah. you know, just, and I respect those that, that see that differently, just denying every single, uh, earthly pleasure. I think God wants to prosper us, mm -hmm. but it's a very fine line, especially in a day and age where the prosperity gospel is yeah. preached, where, you know, everybody's just supposed to go out and become a billionaire. Right. Um, uh, and that, that gets, that tends to get people very, very warped and church is very, very warped. So having the balance of relationships, again, the wisdom that comes collectively through these, these different sources in the community is extremely, extremely necessary. I've especially realized that these last couple of years in this whole journey um, of actually, and it's, there are areas that we're still exploring. Like for instance, I'll just be very vulnerable, like the whole personal brand aspect. Yep. Um, I very much feel like the, the desire to, I mean, I'm connecting with all these incredible people and I see that as multifaceted in terms of the opportunities there. Mm -hmm. But I've also even already identified things inside of me that, you know, I'm not saying that there's anything wrong necessarily with getting attention, but there's, there's an ego inside of me too. And I have to be very careful that that doesn't get out of balance again in what I believe is my mission in life and what I've devoted myself to. So, uh, being, having, learning to navigate some of the, nuances of, of growing a following and all of that and, um, keeping the emphasis where it should be and keeping the, the negative repercussions in check, si the side effects, so to speak, is definitely an ongoing discussion and something that, um, I'm very conscious of. So yes, it, it determines my faith determines every decision I make. Thank you so much for sharing all that. That's really some great stuff. Um, 
Yeah, it sounds like you're very thoughtful about it, obviously. And and like the example of the personal brand, I think that can be very tricky. And I think people have a tendency to go either way too too much or or, or way too little. And it, it, you're shining your or you're not you're hiding your light, right? And uh, yeah, it's um, I'm. I'm interested. I I'm working. You mentioned gifts and skills and inherent abilities that we've all been gifted with, and we have different ones um, in the body of Christ, right? And so, I I've started this program called Prime Movers with a guy named Chip Ingram, who who is actually a, a in a pastor was in Texas. He's now out in California. But the idea is to find your, what he calls your holy ambition. So it's like using your gifts, talents, and abilities for God's kingdom, right? And so it's uh, something I just started a couple months ago. So I'm very excited about this and fun to talk to you about it, about uh, you're definitely using your gifts in a, in a great way. And I think it's awesome uh, that you're able to come on in a show like this and talk about it. How do you get started with stock investing? I've put together a course to teach you everything I wish I knew when I first started investing in stocks. Let's start at the beginning and ask, what is a stock? Let's zoom on in into what it's actually like to buy a stock. A few options are Charles Schwab, TD Ameritrade, Ally, E-Trade. Fortunately, you won't have to necessarily calculate all of these taxes yourself. I'll outline a few main ones to be aware of throughout your lifetime investing journey. As Warren Buffett says, your best investment is yourself. There's nothing that compares to it. By the end, you'll be savvier about stock investing and personal finance than the vast majority of people. Even if you're not a total beginner, I'm confident you'll get a lot out of the principles and strategies I outline, which we'll build on throughout. A link to the course is available in the description below. See you there. I'll look that up. That sounds interesting. Yeah, it's it's geared towards business people. There's a, you know, you work with a small cohort of people. There's four of us in this small group led by a facilitator, and it's a pretty intensive work. A lot of, a lot of reading, a lot of deep thought and study and writing. And uh, I love that stuff. So we did the skill. Are you familiar with the, um, oh, what's it called? It's like the skill finders or skill, it's skill finders 2.0. It's a Gallup thing that's, there's 34 different skills that people can have. And you, you've, get a top five like skill assessment. And those are obviously that your, your strengths that you just want to focus on. Strength finders is what it's called. I would love to know. I've not heard of that. I'd love to look into it. You know, it's a questionnaire that you can do and it's, it's actually super accurate. And uh, yeah, it's just the idea that you, you take your top five skills and that's where you want to be focusing your time and energy on and anything that, you know, falls out of that purview, you delegate off to somebody else. That yeah. sounds like it could be super helpful. Yeah, it's good stuff. So, well, thanks for sharing all that. I didn't know that we were going to go down that rabbit hole, but <laughs> I appreciate you sharing. Yeah, I, w I will just say, and I'm sure we can transition into some of the other stuff, but this could be a segue to that. But I see the vision that we have with the you know Christian communities that are supposed to be a a uh, a living testimony, so to speak, to others as far as to unity. I mean, we look to Jesus is saying that uh, in John 17 there, by your love for one another, the world is going to know that, that you're my disciples. Mm -hmm. And so therefore our, our testimony of unity, again, that should transcend even our words is going to be the greatest form of evangelism. But with that whole vision of community and an entire lifestyle, an entire society and everything encompassing a community encompassing all that. I see the hospitality yeah. as such a wonderful way yeah. to preach the gospel, actually, to show love for others to and not judge them, to uh, serve other people selflessly. And that's part of the reason I feel so passionate about what we even, the, the small amount of you know success and resonance that we found with Live Oak Lake, it, it was, it's a way to that is very financially profitable yep. to give people what not something that is somehow just, you know, a, a sideshow or somewhat uh, removed from what I actually believe, but what I actually believe life is all about, which is serving other people yeah. um, and meeting their needs. And uh, that's why I'm so excited about this vision of hospitality, which we'll talk about later. But 
how we can even incorporate that into the model that we already have, which we're very hospitality oriented. That's another thing I should mention. I mean, we, we grew up hosting people at our, at our home all the time yeah. from other places, which again is another huge benefit of the community. Like not only are, are these other community members from around the world that have different cultures and different perspectives that we can learn from and the, very impactful as a child, but also just strangers, friends, relatives that don't see the world the same way that we do. And again, being so open and hospitality minded mm -hmm. was incredibly beneficial, I think. So I'm very excited for how all of these things can work together. Yeah. And again, bring that harmony and cohesion to your own personal existence and your purpose in life yeah. instead of feeling so fragmented, which is m much more common today, it seems. Yeah, I would agree with that. 100% agree with that. So for our listeners that, that don't know about what you're up to, we're kind of deeper into the podcast here, but tell us about Live Oak Lake, what it is, the inspiration behind it, and uh, just kind of go into the, the details of what Live Oak Lake is. Yeah, so Live Oak Lake is seven uh, modern Scandinavian styled cabins nestled around a, a small lake, giant live oak trees, walking trails, kayaking, hammocks, fire pits, just beautiful, serene environment. Five acre property here, five minutes down the road from where I live. And the, the short story is I was, I had been in Idaho. I moved back to Texas, got married, um, was also doing accounting. I didn't mention that earlier, but uh, I had a small cloud-based accounting firm and had the construction experience had always been interested in design. I'm an artist, was looking to somehow bring all of these things together, naturally was curious about real estate mm -hmm. to bring all these different skill sets together and had this idea of why not create this little property that, you know, basically a village of really cool cabins and didn't articulate most of that at the time, but knew that it just felt intuitively like this would work. Mm -hmm. And started looking for property. One morning while scrolling Zillow, found this five acre parcel for $130,000, made an offer that day, went out, looked at the property, was just blown away. I had driven by this particular spot like tons of times, but it never stopped to actually examine what was there. It just looked like a, a bramble of trees. It was incredible, needed a ton of work, but these massive live oak trees were just awesome. Long story short, bought the property nine and a half months later of intense season of, you know, designing, building, furnishing, outfitting the property all myself, obviously with the help of, of uh, subcontractors, other friends that helped with different aspects, but I didn't hire engineers or architects or interior designers or any of that. I was really doing that myself, dealing with the bank and uh, all the complexities of actually financing it when it went way over budget, but pulled off this project, opened the doors in, in January of 2022, and right out the gate was just blown away by yeah. the response. So didn't have any following on social media, didn't ha hadn't done any press or any marketing, but through a series of events, started posting on Instagram, got picked up by a couple other influencer accounts in Texas, got a ton of attentions, went all in with um, influencer partnerships where we would run these giveaways, which just pour poured jet fuel on the fire. And... Um, yeah, grew a, a social media following to, uh, it's now 150,000 in about 18 months on Instagram, a uh, hundred about, sorry, about 95% occupancy overall, 80% plus of, of all bookings coming direct through our own website, 40,000 plus people on the email list, um, and financially, uh, a, a huge success as well. So, uh, really surprised me and blew blew my mind that people would resonate so strongly. But I think one of the key things that made it such a success is I did accurately realize there was no experience like this in Texas. Mm -hmm. There was no architecture like this. There was nothing that was really thoughtfully planned, at least on that level, in terms of a, an all-encompassing experience that was immersive for people to come to. So a common anecdote, when people come visit Live Oak Lake, they say, when we walk, when we drive in the gate, it's it's fenced and gated 24 seven. So again, it kind of is this all encompassing feel. They say it feels like we're, we're coming to a different world. Mm -hmm. And there's a saying, the way you do one thing is the way that you do everything. Yeah. And we certainly try to apply that with Live Oak Lake from every aspect of design and construction to the programming and the, you know, the thoughtfulness of the, the welcome gift and the, the messaging and 
the housekeeping staff and the, the maintenance staff, another key little comment I'll make here. A lot of people ask about hiring. How do you find, because at the end of the day, no matter how much you automate and systematize, which we've done a lot of, mm -hmm. hospitality is all about the heart and soul behind the experience. And there has to be, there, there are key human touch points that we do have with the guests. Maybe it's just a chance encounter with the cleaners when they're leaving the unit and the guest pulls up. And cleaning is, you know, all of these, these different staff roles are so important. A lot of people ask, how do you find these people? I have to just show my cards here. The community was our main source for all of this. So having these built-in relationships of trust and character and work ethic that I, I could, I knew I could trust these people to do a good job. I knew I could train them and trust them to interact with the guests in the, in the best way possible to treat them like family was so immensely valuable and again, inspires me for the potential of how we can leverage that with future projects in the future. But, uh, so again, it's, it's, it's this immersive experience that is a part, a blend of amazing architecture and design with, uh, you know, incredibly hospitable, um, uh, experiences with the, with the hosting staff, um, experiences on the property that are mostly self-guided. Like I said, the kayaking trails, um, but then also proximity to homestead, which, which is where we have this whole working craft village farm. There's other things in Waco. There's Magnolia, which is awesome. Chip and Joanna's little empire there. Mm -hmm. Um, but for the most part, Waco, though it is growing a tourist component, um, well, I should just say it, Waco definitely has a tourism component, but the main guests, the main, uh, demographic of guests at Live Oak Lake have just come from from the Instagram following. So creating this new lane of traffic actually where we're contributing to that uh, is just blowing me away too. The power of social media at getting the message out there, telling your story, but then also other people telling your story, which we've had several YouTubers come out and like, like I mentioned, Instagram creators themselves that have done these giveaways. But yeah, it's been a, uh, an eventful and adventurous ride. So, but that's live. Oak Lake. That's a high level view of it. I want to dive kind of drill down a little bit. When you drove by this property, did, did you, did you have the idea for it already in mind and you were actively looking for the land or it just kind of, you came across the land happenstance. You're looking at Zillow, saw the listing, went to go look at it and decided at that point to do, to do the project or like, you know what I'm saying? Like, did you yeah. have this idea in your mind? Like I need to go find land to go do this or did it just kind of come about naturally and organically some of both so i had this idea in my mind for a while but i was actually looking at a property it's a funny story that was like a quarter mile down the same road that a friend of mine owned and it was on a 50 foot bluff with a with a white rock dry creek in the bottom which is really unique and had this cool view component it also had some liability downsides with the, yeah, the liability <laughs> issues but I was like pretty set on this is the place to do it just because it's unique. And I knew we wanted something that had some, some natural land potential mm -hmm. just in terms of the beauty of the land. Well, long story short is he was moving way too slowly. And though he agreed that if he sold it, I would be, I'd have the first right to buy it. He just was not in, in a hurry to get that done, to survey the piece off that I wanted. And so I was looking more broadly, hence one morning I, I opened up Zillow like while, while I was still in bed literally. And this place had just been listed in the past, in the previous 12 hours, it just gone online. And so I literally called the agent up immediately and got dressed and drove over there like in the hour and met, met them because I knew it would probably go quickly. I was shocked because it was a drone photo that caught my eye that I saw this little cow pond in the middle. And though I'd driven by this place a million times, I'd never known there was any kind of water there. I think it's actually a spring fed lake, which is really cool. We, we ended up digging it out and so was it um, kind of overgrown and, and, and oh, it was unrecognizable. It? it was pure briars brush. And though it had these massive hidden gems, these live oak trees and, and the water in the middle to even see that was almost impossible just because it was so much stuff. There was like this old dilapidated barn in the front. Uh, so yeah, it was definitely a process of 
envisioning. And I spent like two or three days on site, just walking around by myself, trying to figure out what, what is the highest and best use for this? Right. How could we lay out structures that would best showcase the natural land potential that we do have? And how can we accentuate what we do? So we, we ended up taking out probably 60% of the trees, you know, trimmed up almost all the trees that we left, dug out the pond, uh, built out the dry Creek on the bottom side or seasonal Creek. Um, we drilled a small well to feed the pond and in, in the, in the summer in case it went down. Cause we knew that was going to be a really important, um, aspect if, if all of the cabins were situated around it. So yeah, there was quite a bit of land work, site work, which literally my friends and I and family went out there with chainsaws and just did ourselves for the most part. And again, we didn't have any engineers or site planners to lay it all out. It was very intuitive, just a on the boots on the ground approach of trying to put yourself in the shoes and envision what this place could be. And if you were a guest, you know, how far apart would you want the cabins to be and all of that. Did you have the design of the cabin already in mind or did that come about after you purchased the land? Thoreau's got this quote about, you know, when, when you are on a piece of land, every man takes a look at it and is like trying to figure out where, like you said, the highest and best use, where can I put a, my house or my cabin or whatever. Did you, when you were walking the property, like, did you have the cabins in mind already that you were, wanted to build? I was looking and I did not know. No, I did not know exactly what it was going to be. I found this company called Den, D-E-N Outdoors, and they had really compelling designs at the time. I think there were a couple different cabins in process, but they, they didn't even have any completed structures, I don't think. Um, so it was just renderings that I was looking at, but they had done a really good job of selling those. And so I fell in love with some of those designs. I purchased several of them actually, and then combined elements from a few different ones, like the floor plan of one with the exterior of another that I liked, and then tweaked it kind of to taste, added spiral stairs, you know, added a closet, added a washing machine and dryer, did, did a few things that fit the use that I thought was, was best for this, this, uh, property. Um, and hired a, you know, hired a freelancer on Fiverr for a few hundred bucks to make those modifications. Uh, so all in all spent a few thousand dollars out of pocket to have designs that we used. They weren't granted very detailed, uh, which left a lot of room to, uh, improvise as we built, which was very helpful actually, because I didn't have any of the finishes picked out really. I didn't have a lot of the smaller details picked out, but since I was managing construction and over there every single day, I could make all those decisions on the fly, which helped us again, value engineer to keep our costs somewhat reasonable, but also get things done quickly. Cause yeah. that was 2021 supply chain was a huge issue. Mm -hmm. Just getting doors and windows was like four months. Getting appliances was like six or seven months. Some of those things have become more normal now, but at the time that was really, really difficult to plan around. So so wearing all those hats was very helpful, actually. Yeah, it's huge to be able to be your own GC and like do this on the cheap, you know, cheaper than what most people can do it. And it also sounded like a big part of it was that you were in an unincorporated part of town that you were able to do a lot of this without typically, you know, you'd have to go through a lot of hoops that it doesn't sound like you had to jump through. Absolutely. So I actually tell people this when they're thinking about the the market that they should choose or the property that they should choose to create a property like Live Oak Lake. There's a few different factors. And my prior, my framework is this. Number one, you need to be in proximity to a big population base. So mm -hmm. whether that's two hours or three hours driving distance, ideally, you could be further if you're cool enough, like say at Amangiri, which is you know multiple hours from a large population base, but it's such an incredible out of this world experience that they have billionaires flying in to go there. Mm -hmm. But ideally you should be within two hours driving distance of major Metro area. Number two, which is tied maybe even for number one is this question of zoning and regulation. So in general, you need to just look at the state level. Is this a, a state that is uh, generally friendly to new development of this kind or not? And there are some places I'm not saying it can't be done in California, but it is entitlement can take so long, can take years. Yeah. It's, it's just not for me. Yeah. Others may have the appetite for that, but some place like, you know, generally Texas is a high growth. Mm -hmm. There's a ton of people moving here. It's fairly, uh, laissez-faire. There's generally a business friendly and 
um, capitalistic environment mm -hmm. of creating um, development like this, I, I think the biggest, yeah, number one tip is get out of city limits, get into an unincorporated part of the county. At least many of the counties here in Texas, you essentially have zero requirements for building. Now, septics are another question, and that's kind of where they get their foot in the door. Mm -hmm. In our case, that was actually the one aspect where I really needed to hire a good engineer to help us design a system because it's one system commercial for the entire property. Okay. And that's tricky. Sometimes you, you have to have separate systems for each unit. But as far as the actual buildability of it, all you have to do is file a simple application that you tell them that you are building. Mm -hmm. And then you get three third party inspections throughout the process, which literally can be a real estate inspector or an independent, you know, plumbing inspector. Um, so it's not even city staff that's doing this. Oh. And then submit those. And technically, you you don't even have to pass those inspections. They just want you to have them on, and then they have that on file so that future property owners can look that up. So yeah, super super low bar there. I I, I know that there's two sides to to everything, and and the flip side of that, the argument to make, there's certainly an argument to make in the opposite direction, which is go to high barrier to entry markets because mm -hmm. you know that supply is going to be very limited. Yeah. Yes, that's certainly a viable model. It's just not necessarily necessary. It's not necessary for a property like this where you're creating something that's hopefully head and shoulders above anything else that's out there. And if you're really doing it right, which is certainly going to narrow down the pool of those that feel like they, they either have the gifts or the time to, to devote to a project like this because it's very multidisciplinary, yep. uh, then nobody else is going to be able to imitate you, at least for a while. And if they do, you're going to have the first mover advantage because you will have built up a following and all of that. So yeah, find a number one, get in proximity to people. Number two, find a very easy place to build, yeah. i.e. unincorporated parts of the county. And then there are other factors. You obviously want to have some built-in natural land potential. I think that's certainly important. That could be, I think trees are very important. Water is very important. Some of these things you could add in later. Um, Having some diversity of demand is also important, whether that's other leisure travel or a nearby university, um, government business. We're in a really great spot because we're like 15 minutes from downtown Waco. Waco has prominent university. It has, like I said, some some localized tourism, uh, other things as well. We've got great restaurants, so we didn't have to have any on-site F&B offerings, but we're within like two hours, two and a half hours of really the entire Texas triangle, which is over 20 million people. Yeah. So you kind of have both of those aspects at play and we're in perfect proximity to both. If you are going to be further, let's say two hours from a major metro area and you, or I would say anything beyond 30 minutes actually, and you don't have a smaller town nearby that has, or that has great cuisine available, then you, you will need to consider need F and B, right. which will probably mean that you need to push up your unit size to like 35 to 40 minimum to make that maybe 30 to make that viable because that's just a whole nother right. ball of wax. Right. <laughs> I wanted to touch, I've got a real estate background, so I wanted to touch on the construction of the cabins. Were you pounding them out? Like, did you finish one at a time like, and move on to the next one? Or you, you did it in nine months. So how were you so efficient and finish these off so quickly? Having that experience in all aspects of construction and then project management was invaluable to mm -hmm. that. And I also, you know, made plenty of uh, phone calls to my older brothers who still, that's their primary occupation as, as general contractors with questions. But having the network of subcontractors within the local community um, was also very, very helpful in finding people to get stuff done. But yeah, I mean, we did everything all at once. I am very much an all in kind of person. And though it financially, again, going back to some of my imbalances, I would much rather just forget, you know, leave caution to the wind and go all in on an idea if I believe it's going to work. Mm -hmm. And it worked very well in this case. We did think about phasing it into two phases with like, you know, proof of concept with two or three units and then expanding. Right. But I was just like, look, this opportunity cost of this is so big. And that, turned out to be a very, very good assumption that we can't afford to spend three years dragging this out and then have the, the, you know, just the nuisance of ongoing construction in, which is definitely affecting the experience of those that are 
staying here once the first ones are done. So we went all out, did everything at once, which was also nice because there's some economies of scale built in there with especially the subcontractors. Like it was very appealing to them to have essentially cut and uh, copy and paste times seven with and each small cabin nuances. was the same or did you have diff- were they basically small the differences same plan? there's two main plans one is a two we have five two bedrooms and then two one bedroom units the aesthetic is very similar throughout and those two unit types are actually extremely similar it's just an extra bedroom and you know so a few extra feet wide and long and a few extra appliances things like that and then we flipped some of them so there's mirrored plans in other places. So there's technically four distinct units, the unit types, but it's really just two with mirrors. And then the way in which we laid them out with the trees that they're situated around and the topography and you know the, the views that we framed through all the windows and the glass openings was our main way of providing some differentiation between them. And as, as well as the names of the units themselves, which have to do with their location on the property. Uh, and I think that that's a, actually a really valid point there too, is you want to have enough built-in diversification that when guests are coming to stay at, you know, Shadow Bend, which is our flagship unit under this one massive oak tree, they look across the pond and they see um, Lakeside South, which is also extremely cool and just beautifully framed in the opening of the trees that it's in. And they're like, I want to go stay there. That's that's a hard balance because you you've got to maintain the cohesion between all of them and providing that overall brand aesthetic that people are going to though they won't detect all of the similarities between the decking that we used in the you know floating dock and the um, decking on the front porch and the color of the chair on the dock and the color of the door on the on the cabin whatever all those little pieces that are communicating with each other and that are signifying this overall brand they won't necessarily pick up on all those but they will pick up on the general feeling that all of that communicates and so every aspect the container pool all the on-site amenities the hot tubs the the walking trails um the kayaking the cabins themselves interior design the front gate the landscaping all of these different components are all tied together in a very intentional way and that's, I would argue, one of the most important pieces of creating that ambiance and environment. The lights, the way that when the, when the lights turn on, the time of day when they turn off, which is all automated. Um, so many, so many different aspects of it that yeah, you you don't think of in at least immediately, but when you go to build it and you operate it, you realize the importance of all of these things. And yes, yeah, so the, those potentially create a massive workload to keep on top of all of these, you know, just maintenance alone. Mm-hmm. And yet, and I think as I already said, that's a very important role, a maintenance person, but there's a lot of things you can automate. So with smart home technology, we've taken away so much of more of the menial mundane things and yet been very intentional about what those key touch points are with the guests, like the welcome gift, like the messaging, like the chance encounters with the onsite staff that will mean a lot to the guests when they do have those. It just sounds like, like you said, how you do anything is how you do everything. And it just seems like you guys have been so oriented to attention to detail that everything has been very thoughtfully um, constructed, thought about, you know, it's just an amazing place. I think I started following you. It must've been right around the time you had finished the project. And I, I immediately, you know, I think just, I think most people's experience of seeing it is like, oh my gosh, this play. And it's hard to uh, describe it if you have not seen the photos of it, you know, it looks like this little European village at night. It's just such a cool place. Um, So congratulations, first of all, for just pulling off something like this. The other thing that I found out recently that I didn't know about is while you were doing this, you also were building a spec home and it, and broke your pelvis. So (laughs) I, I am just kind of astounded that you were able to pull all of this off. Yeah. So after I bought this property, actually may have been like a month before I bought another five acre piece just down the road and the spec home market in Waco was just through the roof. So I decided to try my hand at that, which was also helpful because there were more economies of scale Mm -hmm. and lessons learned with subcontractors and just building processes. Uh, But yeah, I built a $750,000 spec house in four and a half months, listed it before it was even complete and sold it and did very well on that, which was 
essential because we were just completely strapped for cash to get the Live Oak Lake project across the line. So it was very nice having that infusion towards the end, especially when we were in that stage, which is so important of furnishing and landscaping where you don't want to make compromises, but you have to, yeah. uh, to maintain that overall aesthetic and, and experience. So yeah, built a spec house. And then a few months before we were done in the punch list phase of, it was like two months actually before we were done with Live Oak Lake. Yeah. One day popped into one of the cabins to check on progress. And, uh, one of the subs was putting in a spiral staircase, was working by himself, didn't have his helper that day and needed help holding something. So I jumped up on a extension ladder that was leaned up and was holding this piece of steel up there as he bolted it in and the ladder slipped out from underneath me and the ladder was leaned against like a balcony. So as soon as it got past that second floor, it just fell. And I just went straight down, you know, like this yeah, and belly flopped onto the concrete, which was quite painful, but yeah, broke my pelvis. Um, Mm. didn't even realize what had happened. I just couldn't hardly move. And you know, some of it was shock initially. Yeah. I was like, no, we're not calling an ambulance. I'm just going home. I need (laughs) to rest. And I couldn't even get in the car and it was pretty, uh, something was wrong, right? Clearly something was wrong. And so ended up going to quick care. They took me to a hospital and then yeah, I had multiple surgeries and was, um, I mean, overall recovered extremely well. It was three months with, with crutches. Um, but yeah, I was, so I was leaning on my friends and family a lot more, even in that last stage, which again, couldn't have done it. I had my brother and brother-in-law come down from Idaho and they helped with the whole setup and furnishing phase. So I was just kind of, you know, hobbling around on crutches and they were doing all the, all the heavy lifting literally. And, um, that was definitely a, a little bit of a wrench in the works, but even in that, I feel like I, I learned a valuable lesson. I mean, I was going so I'd gone it was going 80 miles an hour in every aspect of my life through that summer of building both those projects. And I think there are seasons of life where you just have to push. I I certainly think that people need to, to lean into those Mm -hmm. when, when they're in one of those, we didn't have any kids, um, which was also, we'd just been married, you know, a few months previous to that. We didn't have any kids. Um, and so I was just like spending 60 hours, 60 hours a week plus over there at these two projects. In addition to all these other aspects of, my life. Right. And that's just really hard. But yeah, I mean, going from that to literally laying on my back on a hospital bed, unable to move um, for seven days was actually extremely healthy because it it just made me slow down, zoom out a little bit and reevaluate what my priorities were. And I, I think I was, though I I believe that you need to push in certain seasons. I think I was overdoing it a little bit. And again, that was kind of another example of when my priorities can get out of whack sometimes. Though a lot of other relationships weren't suffering yet. If, you know, if unhindered, unhindered and unbridled, I think a person like me can just uh, fly out of orbit like that. So it was yeah. it's actually really helpful. I just personally realized that there was a silver lining in all of that. And then just also realizing how valuable truly good friends are and family like I have that Mm -hmm. stepped in in so many ways to help our family out and help me out even finishing that project. So, um, made me appreciate them a whole lot more. And also I think enabled me to empathize with others that are suffering in other ways that I'm again, just because I can be so tunnel vision and so focused on whatever I'm doing, I just ignore other realities around me. And so I'm thankful for it for that. Yeah. Yeah, It's an amazing story. I, I wanted to touch on a little bit about what in retrospect, you would have done differently. Any mistakes that you made that you, you know, looking back on things, you you would have done things a little bit differently? So I tell people, I think the number one mistake I made was that I didn't, I was in such a hurry that I didn't document or film any of the process of building. If you're going to go to the, to the hassle of, you know, (laughs) creating a project like this, which is like, what do they say about entrepreneurship that, you know, it's like eating glass and look and staring into the abyss or something like that. Right. Building a project like this is similar. Um, and thinking about all the aspects that go into it. So I was so consumed that I didn't create anything. And I just wish I had documented the process a little bit better. Even if I hadn't used it at the time, I would have that. I have plenty of photos, but even some videos, there's simple things too. You don't need a whole film crew, just some time lapses and Mm -hmm sort of like before and afters can be so powerful visually to storytell when you're 
thinking about marketing that uh, experience to guests because the story is such a big aspect too of the experience. Like our family, my wife and I, we've since sold it, but our family was, I mean, I, I spent as many, as much time as I could over there just interacting with guests and our stories in the, in the welcome manual, which we very carefully crafted. And mm -hmm. it's kind of, again, baked into all the details of it, how we created it, what we do, why we enjoy it. And so even the construction phase is just pure gold from a content perspective to, to capitalize yeah. on. So that's one. Another one is, um, I didn't originally have any of the units that were ADA accessible and it's, uh, a little bit of a gray area, even legally. Uh, but if I had to do it again, I would certainly do one of them accessible. Um, we've ne it's never impacted our occupancy. I mean, we've been yeah. so busy, but it's, it's just a bad feeling to have to turn people away. Right. And it's not even that we don't have bedrooms downstairs. Stairs aren't really the problem. It's just basic things like doorway openings, um, mm -hmm. and turn radiuses. So that's another thing I would certainly look, I, I guess also that's maybe a negative side effect of the lack of regulation and right. um professional input from architects and engineers yeah yeah but yeah those are the those are the two main things overall i mean there were lots of little tiny things uh like i forgot to wire in under cabinet lighting so i had to use battery power there's just lo lots of little things i think most of those actually could be attributed to the lack of professional input but they were all great learning experiences too because i've got a long list of nitty-gritty details that i can't wait to um, incorporate into my next project. Yeah. And it sounds like you you and your wife, like you spent the night in each cabin, you, you know, you learned every aspect of the business so that you could then, you know, properly teach somebody else how to do it, uh, really knew what was going on. You mentioned that you had sold the property. So I wanted to kind of touch on that a little bit. A project yeah. like this becomes your baby, right? I mean, it, this is like your pride and joy. And so I wanted to hear like how that was for you selling it. Yeah. So we didn't intend to sell, but it was always in the back of my mind that if somebody gave us the right number, we'd sell that number grew initially. That number was 3 million. Then that number was 5 million. And I'll just be very transparent because that's what I've done through the whole journey, sharing all the numbers. And, uh, it's a double-edged sword because just as a side note here, some people are just automatically angry when you are financially successful and or or assume that you must be a grifter because you're right. sharing all these numbers. So right. you have to be careful, obviously, but I've I've found overall that just being truly authentic and transparent, even with all of the numbers that go behind something, everything about the story. It's like social media again is such a so it's so tempting just to tell the positives or just to sure. you know be hyperbolic in exaggerate your storytelling. Yep. I've tried to just share everything. Fortunately, I guess I should say we've had so many wins that it can appear like this was, yeah, right. this is a little unbelievable, but yeah, we, so we built the project for 2.3 million all in, uh, financed it through a line of credit. I got through my family with their construction company, which was essential, um, to supplement the main construction loan that I got from a local lender, some personal cash four months after we opened, we reappraised, refinanced, locked in a great rate long term. This was July of 22 before the rate crisis that we're in right. and uh, was able to pull out all the equity, all of the short term debt, pay off everything and have like $400,000 tax free right. in addition to that. So yeah, that was a huge win. And then, but yeah, we, I was like always thinking if somebody wants to pay us the right amount, I mean, everything has gone so well from a media perspective, from a just high level, just basic numbers perspective here with the uh, business side of it that we may, we would be stupid not to consider it. So we, we, actually, we ended up listing it for a few months last year. Well, it was actually 2020, late 2022, had several interested parties, had several private equity shops that were interested most of them sort of lowballed the number I was wanting. And also one of them gave us a very fair offer, but they wanted to buy like 70%. Yeah. And then basically you stay retain me. Yep. Go yeah. build them a portfolio. I wasn't yeah. particularly interested in that. And it just didn't feel like the time was right. So we took it off. And then beginning of last year, we relisted it with another broker and had a bunch more offers 
were under contract to sell for 6.5 million uh, and got down to the to the day before closing. And then the buyers had to back out. Their hard money lender had uh, backed out on them. They were pretty That's... amateur investors and yeah. uh, weren't quite prepared to handle this. Right. And then like five days later, we get another LOI from another buyer for a half a million higher for seven. And initially they wanted to sell it. They wanted us to sell or carry a, a big portion of it for a time. We weren't interested in that. We ended up negotiating a deal for 7 million that didn't require us to sell or carry anything. And they actually passed their, um, their dates like multiple times. We had to extend the contract. The due diligence was fine, but they had like a key investor back out with a random from a random unrelated circumstance and different, different things happened. I, it was such a masterclass in, in real estate transactions, which I'd never been involved in. Mm -hmm. What's the saying? Uh, birds fly, fish swim, and deals fall through. And it definitely felt like that. Everything that went wrong or could go wrong went wrong. And then finally, multiple months after we were we had originally gotten under contract, they finally got it together and were able to close like the final day of the final extension that we had agreed to. Because at that point, like you've invested so much into the process and though there's a lot of lessons that you can take away, like having enough earnest money and hiring the right attorney and all of these other things. Um, it's just a little bit emotionally exhausting because yeah. it's like, are oh, we yeah. selling? Are we not selling? 100%. To your point, yep. it's very much feels like my baby. It still feels like that in a certain sense. And I'm always going to be proud of it. But I've already kind of made the made the break from it. And yep. yet we're still in this no man's land. So it was actually a really great feeling <laughs> when yes. it finally came through yeah. in last October. And uh it's been it's been an interesting season since then too. Um I'm I'm hoping to 1031 a good chunk of the gain there mm -hmm. into the next property, which I'm still looking for. Um I did take a little bit of cash off the table and it's been nice to take a little bit of a break. Yeah. In the meantime, I've been building this personal office slash art studio out. Yep. here at my house, which is kind of a dream project for me. I designed and built yeah, it looks awesome. this, this new iteration of my taste. So it's, we've incorporated, it's got a lot of similarities to live Oak Lake uh -huh. as far as the aesthetic, but it's definitely incorporated some new elements as well. And then, yeah, I've been also very focused on the masterclass and the community. I was doing a bunch of one-on-one -on -one coaching with folks when I started telling my story or in 2022. And then after about 20 of these calls, just sort of realized I'm getting the same questions over and over again. So took the time last year. It was a lot of hard work, but spent a few months and thought through, crafted the syllabus for the course and then filmed everything on site at Live Oak Lake, brought in a whole panel of guest experts and assembled this resource that is hopefully as comprehensive and top to bottom as any out there and as highly produced as any out there, if not more so. And then basically sold that to a, a first round of students last summer, got a ton of amazing success and feedback from that success stories from the students, which I was able to then iterate the process and then have since built out this community. So the idea there is, you know, bring together a, uh, the collective wisdom of all these other operators that are out there, most of which I'm, I'm still learning about new ones on a daily basis. There's such a wave of experiential hospitality right now. Mm -hmm. And I've built a small following, but so I feel like really privileged to be in a position where I'm getting a lot of people coming to me, but I'm going, I'm just realizing how many amazing people are out there already that we can learn from each other. So it's basically a sounding board for this collective wisdom. If you have questions, if you need feedback in the, in the process of raising money, of constructing, of operating, of selling a property like this, this is the place to be. We have biweekly calls. We have the ongoing discussion groups, um, in chat format, we have shared resources like our underwriting models, our message templates, um, pitch decks, all the things that we all are, are needing. Um, we have a member map where people can see where other community members are. So it's very visual as well as other projects and properties that are inspirational, which is something I'm always selfishly interested in because sure. I'm trying to figure out not what the competition is, but what the inspiration is out there that will help yeah. expand my own thinking of what's possible in the space. Yeah. So that, yeah, the masterclass and 
community have been super fulfilling. Um, if anyone wants to check that out, it's called Experiential Hospitality. The domain is experientialhospitality.com. Um, but yeah, it's and been it a busy much, few... It pretty much gives the whole playbook, right? Of what you learned and how to replicate what you've done, correct? Exactly. It is it is the top to bottom blueprint where I'm just candidly sharing everything yeah. and divided into all the major phases of a project from conception through design and construction through automation, the software stack, m through marketing, social media, building an audience, and then, uh, yeah, now selling. So the yeah. whole life cycle. I may be taking it or I'm definitely interested in it. I think I shared with you, my wife and I are looking for our next project and We've got six acres of land north of Columbus, Ohio, right on a river, huge mature trees in a flood zone, though. So we're thinking kind of like along the lines of Ben Wolf doing a spyglass kind of thing. And I, she's super excited about it. We just finished a project here, which is totally separate. And I kind of want to put the brakes on, but uh, she loves ideas and loves this kind of stuff. So we'll see. Yeah, you totally should. It's amazing opportunity right now wherever you are there's a lot of places ohio is like actually the has one of the epicenters of what i would call this burgeoning experiential hospitality movement yeah. i've never actually been to the region but the hawking hills area is yes. just loaded with these yep. gems of of a property yeah so yeah i need yeah. to come check it out myself yeah you should you, sh you definitely should hawking hills is gorgeous uh there's amish country my wife and i stayed in a you know super high-end tree house for market research <laughs> and uh, it was our anniversary, but it was, the perks of the job. Yeah, it was beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. But uh, this is a good place to, to stop. Isaac, I really appreciate your time and uh, really congratulate you on selling Live Oak Lake. Looking forward to seeing what you're up to next. I'm going to check out the master class for sure. Um, but for people who want to learn more about you, what's what's the best way for them to do that? I am on Twitter and Instagram at Isaac French underscore. I've been taking a little bit of a much needed break from those platforms, but I should be resuming that shortly. And then I'm also one of my New Year's resolutions in addition to reading a lot is writing a lot. So I'm writing a weekly newsletter uh, at IsaacJFrench.com. You can sign up where I'm for free breaking down a lot of the lessons that I've learned th through this whole journey and uh, hopefully giving people a lot of value that they can actionably go and implement. So awesome. those are the awesome. two. I'm going to sign up for the newsletter. Thanks so much for your time, Isaac. I appreciate it. I now understand a little more about how deeply critical it is to the future of our like happy civilization and living good lives and getting along and being safe and well-fed and comfortable and being able to be generous with each other. Like the value that we all get from technology of, of today and the technologies of the past that we now completely take for granted. I, I just find it so magnificent and such a moral good that I'm like even more deeply enthralled with it than I was when I just thought it was cool.